We interrupt this program to bring courage to Cowardly Dog! Villains. Creepy stuff happens in the middle of nowhere, and about 9 times out of 10, that means there's someone creepy to blame for the nightmares. Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Bench, and this is Courage the Cowardly Dog Villains. Bad to Evil. All right, the rules. For this list, we'll be taking some of the most memorable and the most wicked villains from the four season run of everyone's favorite scary childhood show. This being a bad and evil video, we'll be excluding some characters who do do damage but mean well. We'll also be looking at their run across multiple episodes for the recurring baddies. Lastly, proceed with caution. As an adult, you probably forgot that nowhere is really scary. First, we have the bad. These are the villains who are sympathetic, incompetent, and have some potential for redemption. Beginning the list, we have our least bad, Goosey God. It's not going to be too often that we have a character on here for being too good to one of the family members, so don't get used to it. Goosey God was dangerously close to not being considered a villain, though he was Eustace's rival in an episode as they competed for Muriel's affection. We actually agree with some of his points that Muriel deserves better and should be pampered. What we do not agree with was his refusal to accept that she was taken, the disregard for her boundaries, and the decision to kidnap her when she wouldn't willingly leave her husband. Next is another deity, Storm Goddess. As Muriel said, it can't be easy being a Storm Goddess. We empathize with her and the pain of losing her dog, Duncan. That being said, it's never right to steal someone else's dog or try to take the love someone else has just because you're going through a rough time. Third is one of the most chilling characters, King Ramses. If you're anything like us here at Wicked Binge, you've woken up from at least a couple of nightmares when you're being told to return the slab. King Ramses and his plague scared an entire generation of future horror fans, but honestly, upon revisiting the episode, he was completely right. King Ramses rose from the dead to inflict plagues on anyone with this stolen slab, but that's more of a defense mechanism. Unlike a lot of the baddies on this list, he gives ample warning that he's about to do something unpleasant and instructs on how to get him to stop. We think his biggest sin is letting Courage and Muriel suffer at the hands of his plagues, when it's clear that they have no control over Eustace or what he does with the slab. In fact, one might argue that of the three members of the family, Eustace actually suffers the least. Next is the show's first villain, the evil shadow of a cruel old man. For an evil shadow, the cruel old man turned out to be more of a villain than the actual antagonist. It turns out that the shadow has no real desire to be evil, but feels that is what the shadow of a cruel old man must do. While trying to live up to that reputation, he uses all of his shadowy powers to inflict fear on the innocent and manipulate the Bag family into violence against each other. Only after having a heart-to-heart -heart do we learn that the shadow's heart is not really in such work. There have been several villain arcs like this on Courage, but this was the first. Letting Courage help Shadow find a place among the stars set the perfect tone for the series' recurring theme of rehabilitative justice. Next is Dr. Gearheart's house. Dr. Gearheart, the sound doctor, is free and clear from our villain list for his good intentions. His house, on the other hand, after Gearheart brings his house to life, it becomes abusive towards him. It controls what he does, who he sees, and keeps him in isolation. Of course, Gearheart is partially to blame for not taking better care of his now sentient home, but he doesn't cause anywhere near the amount of damage that his house does. Then we have Basil. It's difficult to tell how evil Basil is, especially since he seems to suffer from delusions. It makes his motives as confusing as his actual crimes. What we do know is that he loves his uncle Twinkle Toes and his mama Mashed Potatoes, enough to give up the life of crime at their request. Though he was a fearsome villain and can wield a mean fish, we have to trust Muriel's judgment here that he's not truly a bad man deep down. Next, we have the eggplants. The message of this episode was troubling in a way that only Courage knew how to be. When a drought affects Nowhere's farmland, the eggplants decide to revolt. They don't like that Muriel has plans to cook and eat them, so they intend to do the same to her. Revenge is always a moral gray area, isn't it? We appreciate them standing up for themselves, but think that their plan to cook and eat Muriel in retaliation may have been taking things a little too far. Of course, the water is muddied when it's discovered that the eggplants always turn violent when they don't have enough water. We're not sure where that leaves us on the spectrum of human-eating eggplants and eggplant-eating humans, 
We only know that we seriously would not want to cross these guys when they're thirsty. Next, we have one of the most iconic characters, Freaky Fred. Honestly, there's worse that he could have done than shaving people, but there's something unsettling in the way he goes about shaving people. We sympathize with his compulsion or whatever it is that makes him feel so naughty, but we wouldn't want to be left alone in a room with him, especially a bathroom, and especially if that bathroom had a razor. He's got to take some of the blame. If you know that you have an uncontrollable urge to shave heads, working as a barber just seems like you're asking for trouble. Next, we have Velvet Vic. In some ways, he's just doing what he's got to do. In other ways, he's trapping people inside of cursed records so that he can escape and play music, which from our understanding is what he was already doing inside the record. Since being eternally trapped inside a record is worse than, you know, getting shaved, we decided that his actions are worse than Fred's. It is worth mentioning, however, that we agree with his reasoning a little more. Next, we have an entertainer, the great Fusilli. This director of the stage is so dedicated to the world of entertainment that he would gladly trap innocent people so they might play their part for him. This includes turning them into puppets and potentially a part of his invisible, echoing chorus. And there's one more big shot star that needs including. Next is Benton Tarantella. This zombie director makes a couple of appearances, and both times he has nefarious intentions. On the first occasion, he plans to raise his creative partner from the dead and film their attack on the Bag family. The second time, he creates a show where the audience laughs at how horrible all the characters are to each other. Unsurprisingly, Eustace is the star, and the money coming in reinforces all his bad behavior. You can hardly fault a director for directing, so this might not seem like the worst scheme. The consequences, however, are dire. They affect not only the immediate family being filmed, but the rest of Nowhere, which seems to grow more violent while watching. It says a lot about Nowhere as a society and perhaps people as a whole. Following him is fan favorite LeQuack. Although he's considered one of the show's two biggest antagonists, we don't think LeQuack is all that evil, at least not in the grand scheme of the series. What puts him so high on the list is that he targets very vulnerable people. The first time he makes an appearance, for example, he's pretending to be a doctor when Muriel has amnesia. He uses the false treatments as a way to try and rob the family of their valuables before courage intervenes. While that makes him a cruel thief, we have to admit that his sole intention is not to cause harm. That argument wouldn't hold up well in court, but and unfortunately makes him better than some of the upcoming cast. Next is Widow McPherson. After her husband was fed to the Loch Ness Monster, allegedly by Ma's great-great-great-aunt, she waits for an opportunity to get revenge. She sees her chance when she gets the notion to destroy Eustace's marriage, tormenting him slowly and blaming Muriel. There's a lot to unpack. Eustace, in this one instance, is innocent, for one thing. For another, Muriel, who is not even a relative, would be suffering just as much as him. There's also the very painful manner of the torture, putting lobsters in his pants, dropping chandeliers on him, almost breaking his back. Not only did she try to harm him for something his great-great-great-great-aunt did, but she almost killed him, and this was made worse by the fact that she teams up with Ma, someone she probably should have been targeting in the first place. Wrapping up the tier, we have the snowman. His actions can be selfish, cruel, and make him into a dictator, but we can kind of see where he's coming from. In a not-so-subtle warning message about global warming, the snowman tries in both of his appearances to avoid the fate of being melted, like his fellow snowmen. The first time we see him, he does this by forcibly extracting a gene from humans that makes them not melt. The second time, he creates a West Pole, making Courage, Muriel, and Eustace work themselves into a frozen stupor to meet his demands. It's worth noting that after that, he comes to see them as family, and he's quick to abandon his new paradise once his friends are returned to him. While we don't agree with his actions, it's hard to argue when the alternative is letting his home and his entire race melt into nothing. Desperate times call for desperate measures and all that. We now move on to the evil. These are the characters who are lacking a good reason for what they do or are simply willing to take things too far. They are the villains that even Muriel would have a tough time forgiving. First, we have the Clutching Foot Gangsters. When Eustace's foot fungus takes on a life of its own, things get nasty pretty quickly. Led by Big Toe, the Gang of Five is completely rotten. They're willing to absorb their host, put the squeeze on Muriel, and blackmail Courage into doing all their poorly thought out dirty work. Though their motivation seems to be primarily financial, they make it clear that they'll do anything to make sure that their orders are followed. Up next, we have Maria and Mono Ladrones. 
These two are trouble. The thieving is one thing, especially since the couple do need to pay for Mano's procedure, but the way they go about the thieving is unnecessarily complicated and they drag in the bags for seemingly no good reason. They're already escaped convicts, so it seems cruel and unusual to steal the identities of Eustace and Muriel before committing their second crime. They go out of their way to ensure that they have Muriel's ID and glasses to leave at the crime scene. If they can think to do that, couldn't they have thought just to not leave anything behind in the first place? It's not like the Nowhere Police Department are known for being thorough investigators. On almost the opposite side of the spectrum is Cajun Fox. The Ladrones were gleeful about doing petty crimes. Cajun Fox was very matter-of-fact, dare we say, almost apologetic for a very serious crime. He tried to cook Muriel. In his defense, she was the last ingredient that he needed for his Cajun granny stew. But also, that's not really a great defense for eating sweet little old grannies. Following him is the Queen of the Black Puddle. She shapeshifts into a beautiful woman to lure her prey into the water. There, she seduces and tries to eat them. Yeah, we're still talking about the kids show. Obviously, all the seduction and killing was PG, but that doesn't make this any less of a scarring premise, nor does it make her actions any better. Now we move on to the Sandman. For an immortal king of sleep, he's certainly prone to some mortal problems. We understand and empathize with this plight of insomnia. No one thinks at their best when they've been struggling and failing to sleep for years on end. Deciding to steal sleep from a mortal he's helping, we might forgive him for acting on that impulse. But deciding to keep her sleep? Once he's had several good nights of rest at Muriel's expense, there's no justification for keeping it. Mortals can die from insomnia, and he of all people should know better. He also should have been able to find the cure for himself without forcing courage to intervene. These actions would be selfish for a human, but they're downright unforgivable for someone that should be trusted with our dreams. Next is Buffo. Buffo, the Frog King, brings in all of his frog followers to create a new paradise in the center of Muriel and Eustace's home. Considering that the frogs land with a splash at the end, we have to wonder how hard this king tried to find his people water before just deciding to enslave and eat humans. We would wager not too hard. After him is Rumpled Kiltskin. Not to be confused with the very different and much improved Rumpled Stiltskin, Rumpled Kiltskin is a bitter man who operates with the labor of the people he kidnaps and overworks. He tricks Muriel into kilt production so he can make the profit from her efforts, all because his mother gave him a name he didn't like and never thought to change. Next is Magic Mondo. Mondo's biggest trick seems to be hiding his true nature. The magic dust he uses to conjure illusions cannot hold a candle to him, pretending to be interested in being a magician. All he wants is to turn Muriel into a gross bug monster, so he can have a gross bug ride. There have been people on this list already interested in stealing Muriel but none that wanted to turn her into a bug monster first, and none that were so good at tricking courage in the process. Following him, we have the Underwater Tribunal and Cannibal Fish. This is another one that sounds perhaps too dark to be a children's show, but that's the standard that Courage set. The Underwater Tribunal sends a fissionary to check on the family and see if they have stayed civilized since they have left the ocean. The family's found not to be civilized and are forced to enter a re-education facility underwater where the three of them are treated like fish. There's a lot to be said about the organization, the invasion of privacy, the ridiculous standards, and generally about the forcing of one's culture onto other people. But the fish that really steals the show is a pet fish that uses the first opportunity he gets to eat their sushi, which in this context is basically cannibalism. Then there's Dr. Gerbil. You can probably still hear the annoying refrain of, it's a gerbil world playing. After tricking the family into his customized vacuum cleaner, Dr. Gerbil runs experiments on them. He's been doing this with countless other humans, and all for the production of things that, unless we're mistaken, already exist. While the music may be the most chilling and memorable clip from the episode, let us not forget the crimes he was willing to commit for his products. Now we've reached the show's other main antagonist, Cats. Whether he's running a club, a motel, or just competing for the Nowhere Sweets competition, this cat is bad news. He has a strict no dogs allowed policy during all his schemes, but he's the one opponent who comes closest to best in courage on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, he technically won once. In a season one episode, he's able to transform Muriel and Eustace into a washing machine and wrecking ball respectively. Though Courage is able to rescue Muriel by turning himself into a helicopter and flying off the island, it is one of the few early season episodes
episodes where things don't revert to normal at the end. Sure, Katz may have to deal with the loss of Eustace wrecking the island, but all of his people to appliance transformations were successful. Next is Randy Robot. While he may not have been the most memorable villain, we think his power is something that should not go unspoken. After being made to feel like his woodcarving hobby is stupid, Randy does what all the other robots are doing, conquering something, and he conquers the farm. While that doesn't sound impressive, because many of the villains on our list have done this, Randy is one of the most efficient about it. Unlike Buffo or the Snowman, he seems to know exactly how much Eustace, Muriel, and Courage can take. Had Courage not reminded him of his love of wooden reindeer, they could still be in servitude under their mechanical overlord. And he's violent against his own kind, too. When he returns home confident in his woodworking skills and sets up shop, he kills a robot who asks if he can make anything but reindeer. Yikes. Now we have Mecha Courage. Mecha Courage made Courage feel worse about his insecurities. Unlike Randy, Mecha Courage is a robot that doesn't seem to have his own agency. He does what his programmer tells him to do, and that is to be the better dog. Still, it's not hard to take this command, the program, and the individual actions of Mecha Courage personally when viewed through the eyes of our favorite cowardly dog. It's not that Mecha Courage is better, it's how over the top his performance is in every regard. This culminates in a large gladiator style battle between them, where our courage is beaten to the ground relentlessly. Anything that's purpose is to just upstage is going to have no regard for feelings or boundaries. This was a surprisingly poignant tale about the risk of technological advancement that would not have been possible without this shiny metal monster. Then we have Conway. Conway, the contaminationist, is an odd entry this high. Unlike many of his cohorts in this tier, Conway seems to believe that he's doing the right thing and that he's helping people. But don't all villains sort of think they're right? Conway feels at his best when he's breathing polluted air, living in filth, and drinking sludge. It's a feeling that he wants to share, which is sort of a wholesome concept. Where he fails is by doing damage to everyone around him who does not feel at their best under those conditions. He steps into a leadership role by showing them his way of life. Then, he has no regard for their feelings or health. He gets the house quarantined, and had courage not fixed it, he likely would have continued to spread his message of pollution, doing harm to people and the environment. Next is Growth Industries and Ma. We've already talked about Ma once, for her willingness to team up with a ghost against her own son. She's now making a formal appearance along with her company, Growth Industries. They experiment with, manufacture, and sell wigs. This doesn't seem so bad, except for when you realize that the experimentation includes unwilling human participants. The manufacturing is also a point of contention, since their special coral wigs required the destruction of a protected habitat to procure, nearly driving an entire underwater race to extinction. Her unwavering ability to choose her vanity over all else speaks volumes, and she has an entire company dedicated to the same selfish notion. We think her place is well-earned. Following her are the sisters Elisa and Eliza Stitch. They use their quilting sorcery and immortality to trap spirits into their project forever, under the guise of a quilting club. Even the antagonists that mean harm on this show usually don't have the power to enforce eternal limbo onto their victims. Adding literal insult to figurative injury is just how mean they are to Muriel before tricking her into their quilt. Part of it was probably wearing her down so that she would be weak enough to trap, but it's obvious that their comments are taking a toll on her mentally well before the magic is ever brought into play. Anyone who makes that poor woman doubt her quilting ability must be truly evil. Speaking of self-doubt, again, next we have The Perfectionist. There have been many villains on and off the list that have had the ability to make one of the characters self-conscious. We don't think anyone has done it so thoroughly or in such a short amount of time as the series finale villain, The Perfectionist. She teaches courage how to be perfect. After Eustace makes him feel worthless, she criticizes how he walks, talks, and creates. His nightmares about the lessons are so bad that he can barely sleep, and a very haunting image from the show was how bloodshot Courage's eyes were after that restless night. You can see after one day the physical toll that the stress is taking on him. We also think it's worth noting how the perfectionist is literally defeated by self-confidence. When Courage learns that he doesn't need to be perfect to express himself, it literally melts this manifestation of all his insecurities. 
That is pretty evil and all too real. Next is Otto. Otto lives in an air-conditioned office at the bottom of a volcano. His plan was to trick the natives into abandoning their land so that he can build a ski resort in a warmer climate. When he decides it's time to move his plan along, knowing it could kill the rest of the natives, he offhandedly says it's okay because he'll name the resort after them. It's not the same act of maliciousness of some of the other villains, but it's the complete disregard for the lives of others combined with the insatiable corporate greed. Not to mention, that was one of the darkest moments in the series. Next, we have to bring up Dr. Zalost. He is the epitome of being malicious needlessly. He suffers from a deep and unmanageable depression, but rather than try and cure it, or even just suffer in silence with his piles and piles of money, he decides to share his pain. He blackmails the government into funding his unhappy cannonball project by making the citizens miserable. Then, he refuses to reverse the effects, leaving Nowhere's residents just as unhappy as he is. Though he is eventually cured by Muriel's happy plums, the need to make everyone suffer with him says a lot about what evil he is capable of. If only he would use that mind for good. The bronze medal of evil goes to Mad Dog. With a name like Mad Dog, you have to sort of expect that this is a bad guy, right? In one of the most memorable episodes of Courage ever, Courage finds himself trying to rescue a bunny named Bunny from her abusive partner, a dog named Mad Dog. This is initiated by a kitty named Kitty, who honestly was one of the scariest villains in the series, despite actually turning out to be somewhat of a good guy. We considered putting her on the list for the mask alone and her abuse of courage, but decided that the focus of this chaotic episode needed to be on Mad Dog. He rescues Bunny from her relationship with Kitty. Though they're referred to as best friends, it's hard to watch in modern day and not think that Bunny and Kitty were in a relationship. And that's what Mad Dog was supposedly rescuing her from. He's very controlling. He thinks he's entitled to her, and he gets angry when she's not happy. When she works up the nerve to run away, he buries her up to her neck in a giant flower pot for some reason. As we said, it's a, it's a strange episode. The silver medal of evil goes to the vet. Was it just us or was the last season more emotionally draining than the others? Premiering as the first half of the series finale, there was an episode where we get Courage's origin story. Though we already knew he was abandoned as a pup, what we didn't know was that his parents were shot up into space by a mad vet who had separated them for dog breeding in space. Though his plan was not as ambitiously evil as some of the others, he was successful for a long, long time. Even at the end, when he was caught and sent to space with all the dogs, the damage was never undone. Courage was never reunited with his parents. The dogs were never returned to Earth. And as far as we know it, it was all for nothing. It was surprisingly grim for a show that had always been a little grim to begin with. But there's one more person who in deeds, intention, and impact was more evil. The gold medal of evil goes to Eustace Bag. Chances are you were either expecting this from the start or are totally surprised. There's not a lot of middle ground with Eustace. Though he's not the traditional villain for the series and is more often than not someone Courage tries to save, he embodies all the evils that the series tries to warn against. He's selfish, vain, has a lust for hoarding wealth, has virtually no love for Courage, often mistreats or neglects his wife, going so far as to tell her she was his slave woman when she had amnesia. Though his personality can shift from episode to episode, and there are times where he is good, the truth is that he does more damage than anyone else, and he cares the least about his negative impact. A great example of this is when he cuts down the magic tree, because he feels threatened that it's a better provider than him. He doesn't try to be a better provider and will not admit wrongdoing, but he does seek to destroy the thing that's helping the family. He only mourns the tree's loss when he has a need of it. For more evidence, you can look to virtually any interaction that the family has with Shirley the medium. She warns him of what his selfish path will bring upon him. He ignores her and often has to be tricked into doing something nice to break the curse. Finally, we refer you to Season 4, Episode 10, where Eustace starts a men's club with all the show's previous villains. The club serves no other purpose than getting rid of courage, and of course, he doesn't even step in when they chain Muriel and threaten her life. All right, everybody, that's it. Let us know who you think the most evil villain was, and make sure to hit that notification bell and binge our other good to evil videos. But most importantly, stay wicked.